Okay. Let's 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 get the show on the road. Everybody everybody ready? All right. So let's call the order of the Board of Library Trustees meeting for Tuesday, June 16th, 2020. Thanks everybody for being here. So everybody knows uh, Julie is going to be stepping in to be the recorder today. So thank you, Julie. Um, so Julie, can we start with a uh, roll call, please? Yes, here. Not good audio. Yeah, Julie, we're not hearing too well. Trustee Rule. Yes. Oh, that's nice. Here. Trustee Smart. Here. Trustee Sublet. Here. Trustee Tangney. Here. Trustee Thanopoulos. Here. President Sick. Here. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, before we get to start, get started here, a couple of just kind of housekeeping things real quick. There has been a change with the Open Meetings Act uh, on the 12th. So most of the rules are still the same, uh, but one of them has to do with the with, with having a, a, a Zoom meeting like this, virtual meeting like this. Um, it's based on, on, you know, is there a disaster? And since the uh, governor had declared a disaster with the whole COVID-19 is the reason why we are doing this again. Also because during this phase three, uh, you can't uh, you, you can't have more than ten people in a room, so that's why we are continuing to do uh, the Zoom meeting for this. Uh, when we get to other, we will discuss uh, a little bit more regarding uh, regarding what we're going to be doing going forward. A um, couple different things uh, that we have to make sure they they, they want to make sure that everybody can hear. And I'm taking it since everybody heard the roll call. We're going to say that that's fine. But if there is any issues with that, please let me know. Um, right away, please, if you can't hear anything. Another thing is that there has to be a roll call for this on every single vote. Um, so we will be doing that for, for everything as we, as, as we go along uh, for this meeting, okay? So that is all that, any, any questions on that? I think I hit all the points, okay, thanks. Um, so the next thing we've got is public comments. Mike, I haven't seen any. Have you uh, seen any come through? No public comments. No public comments. Okay. But thanks uh, for everybody. Hopefully it's watching it for, for uh, participating and, and, and watching what we're doing here. Uh, so let's go now on to liaison reports. Uh, anything for the Friends of the Library? Yes. Uh, so the Friends are planning on a sale in August, uh, but it would require Illinois and library a lot of large gatherings at that time. Looking at some other sale options, such as the farmer's market, garage sale, or parking lot sale. They're working on electronic payment options uh, still. Uh, they have a plan to restart work in the FOL room. And they've made a second donation for restocking the little free libraries throughout the community. And thank you to Terry Scallon and the Bookmobile staff for um, helping out with that. And uh, they continue to, they plan to continue to partner with the library and the Little Free Libraries uh, monthly throughout the summer. Okay, all right, very good. Any any questions on that? All right, let's keep moving on. Uh, to the foundation, please. Yes, uh, they are working with ITW and their distributor on a list of kitchen items for, uh, for the library and uh, working with the architect on that. Uh, their treasurer, Gary McClung, and Lori Harp, the uh, president of the foundation, are working on elevating their guide star status from silver to gold. They have received the matching restricted funds from the state questers for the external lamps at the Belmont property. That's all I have from them. Very good. Yep. Keep moving forward. Thumbs up. Right. All right. Let's move on here to action item one. So be approval of the minutes of the regular board meeting of May 19th, 2020. Do we have a motion for approval? I so move. I second. Second. Okay. Any comments on that? Okay. All right. So uh, as we said before, we do have to do a roll call on everything. So Julie, if you could go ahead and do that, please. Trustee Metal. Yes. Trustee Rule? Yes. Trustee Smart? 
Trustee Smart. Can't hear you, Deb. You're on mute. Yep. Yes. Trustee Sublet. Hi. Trustee Tangney. Yes. Trustee Thanopoulos. I'm President Vick. Yes. All right. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, everybody. All right. Let's go on to item two, review of the financial report. Okay. I'm going to ask Donna to uh, give that, please. And Donna, you're muted. Okay. On the revenue report, we received $7.5 million in real estate taxes since May 31st. Uh, this is 53% of total real estate taxes budgeted for 2020. Um, I want to let everybody know last month we reported 54%. And um, while we were doing a reconciliation, we noticed that there was a, a bookkeeping error when the village split our um, taxes. So it shows negative this in May, um, but it's not really a negative amount. It was just a correction. Uh, that is it for the revenue report. Okay. Uh, so let's go on to action item three, review of the check register for the period ended May 31st, 2020. Great. Um, I had a couple questions here. So I just wanted to go through the check register and uh, starting on page one, there was a check 80410 for $63 to Pacific Management Services. This is a, a pay phone. Um, we went actually in 2020 from two pay phones to one pay phone. And we're gonna evaluate usage uh, before and after COVID to consider reducing it to possibly uh, no pay phones in 2021, but we'll discuss that internally. Um, Check uh, 80370 on page two was tuition reimbursement for Alexander Esau, $1,780.80. I'm gonna actually go through several of the tuition reimbursements just so everyone can see um, those. Carol Inghe, she um, is getting tuition reimbursement for $1,659 on page two. Also, uh, check number 80378, $1,785. That's Daniel Grossman, tuition reimbursement. Page two, 80353, $879. Tuition reimbursement for Jack Bauer. That's $2,367, $2,500. To Mike Driscoll for tuition reimbursement. Check 80402, $879. For Shannon Myers, tuition reimbursement, page two again, check number 80350, $200.25, and that's for Susan Beckman, tuition reimbursement. On page three, there are two more tuition reimbursements with check 080419 for $2,175. That's for Elizabeth Shiner. And then check 80418 for $2,677.50, Margaret Roundtree's tuition reimbursement. So there were quite a few of those. Um, on page two, there's also a check for Cardinal Color Group for the May newsletter. It was 20 pages and we printed 39,500. And the total for that check was $8,285. On page four, there is a payment back to the library from a credit card payment. Check 80342 for $1,570. And this was a detailed program evaluation software. It's called Quick Trap or Quick Tap. It's a survey um, and it's feedback through email uh, when we're not using the kiosk mach machines inside, but it's much more detailed than the, than the smiley faces. Um, also on page four, there's a credit card reimbursement for project management software. Uh, check 80342 again for $899. And this is Basecamp. Uh, all staff have access to this. 
And um, I did talk to our AT, IT manager and he said he's actually gonna be sunsetting this next year. And we're gonna plan to use uh, Office 365's planner for project management in the future. Uh, also on page four, there was a special check um, for $1,420 for a 55 gallon drum of hand sanitizer so we can <laughs> eat for our staff, <laughs> lots of it. And uh, on page five, check 80409, $940.43, that's to Oak Brook Mechanical. Uh, they came in and replaced a flow switch uh, on our chiller. So they were doing um, some work to our air conditioning unit. Uh, also on page five, check 80424 for $2,295 to standard elevator. Um, the elevator door restrictor was replaced on the center passenger elevator. Um, this is this was found during an inspection that they needed to replace it. So this isn't standard, um, but they did have to do it to make sure we were compliant. And then on page 12, there is a check 80430 for $12,045.06 to Williams Architects. And that's for the Belmont Makerspace Design. What? <laughs> <laughs> that's still happening. <laughs> and that is all I have on the check register. Very good. Uh, President, President Zick. Yes. So the the concern with the phone was not the cost of the pay phone, but the public health hazard that it represents, especially now. And I'm a little nervous that once the building opens up, that, that would be a vector. It's interesting. So you're thinking that we should just take it out? Yeah, I really think there's no purpose to it anymore. It does get a fair amount of usage, um, but I think we could maybe uh, mark it out of use uh, until a later date. Exactly. Cool. I would, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. President, I would say that um, we do serve everyone in the community, even those without a home. So the homeless or children without a cell phone that are of a certain age um, probably do use it. Can you talk about Mike who does use it? I would, I, I do understand the health concern. Um, I don't know if we do sanitizing wipes, in between and have a sign if people, or we put it out of use like a water fountain. But I feel like, I think we need to discuss whether or not it's out of use. If people can, right. users can clean it, just like the bathrooms, um, then we need, you know, we can maybe have like a, a hand sanitizing station right there um, and just let people know how they can clean and disinfect before each use. And, and maybe staff can also do it every hour. We're being pretty selective as to what services and um, uh, uh, I guess resources we have available during our reopening. And um, so things like water fountains are also gonna be uh, not accessible. So anything that would be, as Jen mentioned, you know, a vector that um, could transmit, we would limit usage on. Um, I suppose, I don't, I don't know how we could reliably uh, short of keeping some disinfectant down there or something like that, uh, make sure that people are cleaning it after and before each use. Um, but it's something we can consider. Yeah, I think it's for the case of emergency. So I do um, respect your decision, um, but I definitely in between maybe from now until you do open, um, maybe gather what other libraries are doing in the area for that. We, uh, at Gail Borden, we got rid of our phones a couple of years ago. And, you know, we've got a pretty, uh, uh, a, a clientele that probably could use that phone. Um, but what we decided at that time was, it, it, the use wasn't, wasn't that great. But, you know, um, and if there was a concern with a child needing to go, we, we make the call for them. We will, we will make the call for them. And we've never, no one's ever commented on where's the pay phone. And so I think we, I think it's been at least two years, maybe three, maybe three years uh, when we, we used to have like, I don't know, four phone, no, four, three or four phones. And then we went down to two and one, and then we got rid of it. So I, I think you'd be okay. I, I, if, if my suggestion would be is to put something in front of it, you know, that it's out of service during this time 
Um, kids, if kids are using it, they're not going to clean it. Let's, you know, even, and, and I do think even, even, uh, I think the use will just plummet, even when we're at phase five. I think, I don't think people are going to be, payphones, as John said, are a thing of the past. There, there's a lot of things that are things of, things of the past that, that are going to fall uh, to the wayside uh, with this, from this uh, COVID event. Uh, plus you guys, um, just so you're aware, uh, Journeys has get, have given many of the homeless cell phones. So they already have a vehicle. That's good. I think um, I, I do respect uh, Carol and Deb's and John's suggestion. Um, I just wanna make sure that if children are old enough and don't have a cell phone, that they know, and it, it could be a sign at the kids area, you know, if you need us to place a call, please, you know, we're happy to do so. Right. Obviously okay. they're gonna ask, but I just, again, um, I think that that's a service that we should just market if it is available. If we need to make a phone call for somebody. We can get a usage record and look at how it's being used, but um, anecdotally, I know it's it's used a fair amount. Um, so we'll evaluate it internally. Okay. Yeah, thank, thanks, Mike. Thanks, uh, thanks, John, for bringing that up. Uh, I know it's a small details, but we just want to make sure we just want to make sure everybody's safe, which which I know we all do on there. Okay, um, do we have a motion for approval of this check register? I move that we approve the accounts payable check register for the Arlington Heights Memorial Library of May 31st, 2020, in the amount of one million. $14,940,000 and 72 cents. A second. Okay, any, any more comments or any more discussion on this, questions? Okay, very good. Uh, Julie, could we do a roll call, please? Trustee Nettle? Yes. Trustee Rule? Yes. Trustee Smart? Yes. Trustee Sufflet? Aye. Trustee Pangney? Yes. Trustee Panopoulos? Aye. And President Sick? Yes. Okay, all right, thanks everybody. All right, let's move on to the executive director's report. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay, can you guys see the director's report? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, um, first thing on the report, I'm gonna actually minimize this one. First thing I wanna mention on the report is the stay-at-home activity kits. So on May 19th, our youth services staff began distributing kits, our kids crafts and tween DIY projects outside of our Dutton entrance. Each kit is clipped to a clothesline for the customers to grab as they walk or drive past. Customers enjoy 257 stay-at-home activity kits in May, and the kits mimic the crafts and DIY kits available in Kids World when the library building is open. And the kits uh, for teens will launch uh, in early June. So these have been really popular. We've gotten a lot of good feedback about that. <clears throat> uh, let's see, another thing I wanted to highlight was the language of empathy with artist James Bowie. So our artist and documentary photographer James Bowie worked with programs and exhibits specialist Megan Young and programs and ex exhibits manager Jennifer Chaika uh, to create a virtual event to mark the end of our February to March exhibit, When Home Won't Let You Stay. On May 1st, James joined 28 community members on Zoom for a conversation about his body of work, the library exhibit, and the importance of empathy. The power of personal stories and empathy are even more relevant in the landscape of COVID-19. And the event was recorded and shared on the library's YouTube channel on May 11th and has been viewed 57 times since. Hey, Mike, if I could just throw in real quick, that section that we just went through, uh, the diversity and inclusion, I, I just wanna say, you know, from my opinion, we, we're, we're doing a great job as far as this goes. You know, we've included this as part of a uh, one of our strategic initiatives and, 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 and the letter that you had sent out also, I think included some of, some of those things where we're trying to do with, you know, we, we, for our, our staff, for the people that use the library. And I just want to say, you know, to everybody, to all the staff, you know, thank you for everything that you're doing. Because I think, 
I think we're doing a, I think we're doing a, a really good job. Sure, everybody can get better, but I think we're doing a really good job. So thanks to all for, for, for everything that you're doing. Thank you. Thanks for mentioning that. Okay, uh, the next thing I wanted to mention was the summer reading promotion. So our youth outreach librarian, Emily Leffler, our program, or I'm sorry, our preschool outreach specialist, Laura Dacus, and our youth outreach specialist, Kim McGuire and Emily uh, Mosinski, connected with 1,987 students to promote this year's summer reading challenge. They visited nearly 100 elementary and middle school Zoom classrooms to read stories, book talk, and promote summer reading. Cool. Uh, Cornzine was another thing I wanted to mention. Uh, at May's Inklings meeting, our teen writers collaborated with support from teen librarian Evan Mather and teen advisor uh, Mariel uh, Fichik to create the first issue of Cornzine. This zine includes creative nonfiction, listicles, and original artwork about the quarantine experience. The Cornzine's premiere issue was submitted to the library's COVID-19 uh, stories project and Inklees will work on a second issue at their upcoming July meeting. Let me know if you guys have any questions about anything as I go through these. Would have liked to go on the Discover Your Memory Power one. Yeah. Lord knows I could use that. <laughs> okay, uh, I wanted to highlight our curbside um, pickup. So our curbside whole pickup began on Thursday, May 21st, and our material handling staff uh, deliver holds to customer vehicles that have been processing returns and holds that have accumulated during the library's closure. Customers can also pick up their holds at the walk-up hold pickup at the um, Dutton Street entrance. Circ assistants have been working the curbside stations in the parking garage, the drive up and in the lobby with express uh, bookmobile and senior center holds. Our bookmobile staff have also been checking in new items and assisting with item returns and staff feel grateful that thoughtful guidelines were established before resuming services. Our custom curbside pickup system allows staff to meet the demand of our customers through a scalable pickup system that can handle up to 25 cars simultaneously while keeping wait times in a minimum. And our highest day so far uh, was just on Saturday, we had 549 cars come through and 75 walk-ups. So, um, a normal, I believe, a, well, kind of a high capacity day through the regular drive up window is around 200 cars, and that's over a 15 hour span. Uh, this is over, was over a six hour span. Let's see. The, uh, so this month, our dedicated library staff and gardening enthusiasts volunteered to plant a butterfly garden. The volunteers, uh, Janet uh, Landweir, Ron Moravic, Shelley Plisk, and Terry Scanlon, Lucy Sears, Mary Weber, and Terry Webster planted what will become a colorful garden that will attract butterflies and hummingbirds. So thank you to the Friends of the Library for funding to seed this project. The volunteers also donated flowers from their own home gardens. So that will be, on, that's on the east side of the uh, building. And then, <clears throat> The Friends of the Library also donated over 250 books to be used to stock the little free libraries throughout Arlington Heights. Uh, the Friends have committed to uh, continuing this project throughout the summer. So thank you to Terry Scallon, the Bookmobile staff, um, for taking that on and filling those up. And I want to mention our virtual reference. Our um, chat was extremely busy in May with over 900 chats. This is a 132% increase from uh, this time last year. Uh, obviously, this is one of the main ways our customers are communicating with us currently. Uh, chat surveys sent out in May show that 95% of surveyors found that found chat was easy to use and 93% would recommend the service to someone else. Here's a few comments that um, customers provided. So uh, you people are great. I've really missed being able to come into the library during the lockdown, but no, it was the right decision. Of all the things we've missed since the beginning of the pandemic on a personal level, my top two are the library and the barbershop. <laughs> uh, the service, I always get very specific answers and links. This librarian was really helpful, thank you. Michelle was extremely helpful. Thank you for this great service, especially in these times of shelter in place. I wanted to mention a new Reader's Advisory Program. 
um, called Favorite Things. Our Info Services Supervisor, Pam Schwarting, and Programs and Exhibits Manager, Jennifer Chaika, collaborated with staff across departments to offer a new Reader's Advisory Program, Favorite Things. Rather than a traditional book discussion, this program provides an informal and conversational space for staff and customers to share their current favorite things, what they're watching, reading, or listening to. And uh, we also hosted 35, or I'm sorry, a uh, total of 35 readers attended four uh, virtual book discussions in the month of May. All the titles selected for discussion were available via Hoopla or as an ebook or audiobook. Um, book discussions are a great way to connect online uh, and talk with other readers, especially now. And a couple other things just to highlight. Again, I included um, the top 10 uh, pages on our website that were visited, um, our Stay Informed page uh, with information about the library uh, is the number one, well, second to our homepage, uh, ebooks, databases, um, following behind that, and then uh, events in book, movies, and music. So you can see, you know, people are, are using us um, and how they're using us. They're uh, keeping informed and utilizing the ebooks and databases as a comparison to last month. Uh, last month, um, ebooks and databases were up the top there. Hey, Mike, I know this is going to be a stupid question, but that stay informed. I was going, I, I was going over our website. What, what exactly page is that? I could not find something that said stay informed. Um, let me pull it up real quick. What, uh, what, what page is it? Yeah, I, I, I could. I kept looking for it because you know it popped up there to number two. Oh, maybe it's been taken out. So if, um, if you click the yellow bar at the top of the website. Yep. That's the information you get, but the URL is stay informed. Did it change, Mary, by chance? Should not have. No, it's still there. Um, you know what? Oh, Great. OK, I see it there. Gotcha. It might be a, a capitalization thing or something. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. I was just looking at all the other drop downs, trying to find some that said stay informed. It's not a drop down. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. And then I also included, again, the social media engagement um, and the e resources information. Um, so, a little bit less usage this month uh, with social media, but again, our open rate with constant contact is pretty high at 28%. Um, I would say that's, uh, you know, looking at the past two months, you know, it was much higher. I think people were really um, uh, interested in hearing what we had to say, not that they're not now, but um, uh, I think where things are a little bit uh, more formalized now or more, a little bit more um, normal, things are changing less. So uh, I attribute that to that. And then and Mary, do you have anything you want to add to the constant contact or any of the social media stuff? Uh yeah, I think the biggest growth is in the YouTube. Um, again, we're just adding videos. We have a, one of our graphic artists has pretty much become a full-time video production person. <laughs> um, so we're lucky to have her and she's done great work. So that is really the direction that our, a lot of our time is going supporting the virtual programming and, and videography that programs and uh, youth services and families are doing. Um, Constant Contact, we actually noticed a big unsubscribe rate in a couple of the previous months. So what we've tried to do is put more items in smaller numbers of emails to hopefully decrease that unsubscribe rate. And it does seem to be uh, working a little bit because we had a very high unsubscribe rate in March. We were sending out a lot of, lot of Constant Contacts. So I think there are limits to how much our audience wants to hear from us. And I know that in general, the emails during uh, this time at home from all different types of organizations um, have really grown. So, so we're, we're aware of the numbers and we try to adjust things as, as we can to um, get the, the best numbers and reach that we, we are able. Thanks, Brian. 28% mm -hmm. is fantastic on an open rate. That's, That's our typical. Really what was it, John? YouTube's really taken off. I mean, that is that is uh, noticeable in April and May. Mm -hmm. You'll see um, when we send out an update uh, regarding the uh, path to reopening, 
you'll see a very large reopen rate as well. <laughs> hmm. People will be excited to get that news. Okay, then I also included um, some of the statistics again for the e-resources. Um, no surprise looking at like cloud library, um, just consi consistently see an increase there. And Hoopla, uh, let's see, our Hoopla totals are on this page here. Um, continue to see that increasing as well as Canopy. So people are, you know, continuing to use us even more uh, remotely. Can I ask a question? Do we break it down by, uh, this is Mary Anthony, um, by ages? I'm wondering if the YouTube uh, subscribers, obviously um, looking at uh, probably over 18, or I don't know if YouTube has like an age limit, it might be over 13. But I'm just curious um, on these, if we could really break it down to how many tweens, how many teen programs are on there. That would be kind of interesting. And it doesn't have to be now, I would say for the mm -hmm. annual report. Terry, do you know if that information's available? Yeah, we can, we can put that together uh, for you. We can't tell the user's age in particular, um, but we can certainly break down the types of programming uh, and the numbers for each. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to skip down to some of our uh, staff development news. There were a few, a few fairly large um, milestones this time. Uh, so our circulation services manager, Shannon Meyer, graduated from Valdosta State University with a master's degree in library and information science. In Congratulations, Shannon. Yeah. Congratulations. And then our youth, re youth outreach specialist, Emily Wazinski, uh, completed a dual degree program through Loyola University, Chicago, and Dominican University. She earned master's degrees in public history and uh, library information science. So congratulations. Oh, that's wow. that was a great one. Big, big thing. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Can we send a card or some balloons? Congratulations. <laughs> congratulations. And then our library delivery and accessibility supervisor, Katie Myers, completed the ADA coordinator training uh, certification program that verifies participants have completed training in required content areas and have an in-depth knowledge of Americans with Disabilities Act issues. So Wonderful. Um, great asset for us. And then our senior and accessibility services staff members, Janet McDonald, Renee Witt, uh, Elchin, um, Act, uh, not going to try the last name, and Catherine Maxwell are busy learning the basics of American Sign Language through an eight-week uh, Gale course, Discover Sign Language. So uh, ASL training has become critical as those in the deaf and hard of hearing community uh, face heightened challenges due to the use of face masks and social distancing implemented mm -hmm. to prevent the spread of COVID-19. So trying to adjust for that. Mike, can I, can I make a comment on that? I think it's wonderful. And um, I remember seeing a program where there was a neighborhood who learned how to sign just because the child was in the neighborhood and it was just beautiful. I had a, uh, I went to Target and someone, it might have, I think it was Target, um, uh, the, the cashier was deaf. And I wanted to learn just basic things like how to say thank you. And I'm just curious if, if down the line, this would be a wonderful program, I think, for a community. Yeah, we'll take note of that. When we can meet again. No, thank you. Okay, that's all I had for the director's report. I would be happy to take any questions or anything. Anybody has them? Questions? Okay. All right, Mike, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, let's get on to old business and the Makerspace project update action item four. Okay, so um, Andy Dogan, Nancy, or uh, Natalie uh, Clemens, and uh, Carrie are here from Williams Architects. I will hand it off to Andy if he wants to give an update on his with us. Mike, one real quick thing. It says in the up, it, it says in the agenda it's an action item, but this isn't an action item, right? This is just an update. Correct. Right. I apologize. Right. It must be a mistake on our end. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry, Andy. Go ahead. No problem. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for having us tonight. 
so we wanted to give, and um, we have two parts um, of uh, what we want to discuss with you tonight. This, um, the next part is an, an action item with respect to uh, some of the work that we have received bids for, but we want to give you an update on where we are with the overall project. Um, we are getting very close to issuing the balance of the build out project, um, which includes all of the interior renovations um, and the parking lot um, resurfacing and um, reconfiguration out to bid within the next week. So um, anytime we put together a major project, it's kind of a mad dash to the finish, which we're doing right now. Um, but uh, I wanted to just share my screen and um, show you a little bit of what we've been working on um, just so everybody kind of understands the scope and breadth of what we're doing. And then we have a few updates with respect to interior design. Um, that's kind of the last piece of this that's being finalized before we go out to bid. So I will attempt to share my screen here. So, so what, what everybody's seeing on screen is um, the set of um, co construction documents for the build out as of a couple days ago. And we are um, in the point of the process where we have all hands on deck to um, make sure that um, we are coordinating all of the aspects of the project um, internally between our architecture and interior design teams. Um, and with our engineering team um, for, with respect to light fixtures, plumbing fixtures, um, how the demonstration kitchen is going to work and all of those, um, those good things. So um, to go through every sheet of our documents in detail would um, be more time than um, we have for the rest of the week, but um, our drawings are very comprehensive. We include information on what needs to be demolished and removed um, is part of the project, both in terms of the floor plan and terms of the ceiling and the roof. Um, then site plan showing some of the reconfiguration work with parking. Our new floor plan, um, which is consistent with the layouts and the discussions we've already had with you over the course of the last few months, but just getting into a lot more technical detail. Uh, so those floor plans for both um, floors of the building, ceiling plans for both floors of the building, indicating the ceiling and the um, light fixture placement. Um, again, our roofing plan. Uh, then we have a, a number of details with respect um, to our roofing and exterior work. We like to enlarge certain portions of the project um, where we need to show more detail and more information. So we do that for the new restrooms, for the industrial tool spaces, um, and for the demonstration kitchen. So a lot of detail starting to be worked into the plans as to what's happening in each space. Um, then we draw elevations of every wall surface, um, especially as it relates to cabinetry. Um, and any places that would be receiving tile or different paint finishes. Um, so that's been done um, and is being worked on for the entirety of the project. We detail out the cabinetry that we have as part of the project um, in section so everybody understands how to build it. We indicate um, the interior doors and glazing that's happening as part of the project and specify the um, door hardware in a project manual. And then we specify all of the um, interior materials, um, both in a written description and notation. And then we create separate drawings that show what materials go where, um, both on the floors, on both levels and on the walls in terms of paint colors and the different finishes um, that we have. So, and then just some furniture plan layouts of um, the space for reference. So, as I mentioned, we're getting very close to being um, ready to bid the project. Um, we have, consistent with some discussions we've had over the last couple months, included several alternate bid items as part of this um, project, just to make sure we have 
maximum budget flexibility and, um, and can respond to the bid results um, we do get. Uh, one of the specifics that I want to share with everybody is that um, we are finding as we have completed the engineering on the demonstration kitchen that um, because it's a full commercial kitchen, the village of Arlington Heights requires um, an exterior grease trap. Um, that and what is involved in making that work and connecting it to the village sanitary sewer um, is is becoming a bit more challenging than I think we originally bargained for. Um, we don't know exactly what that cost impact is um, at this point, um, but we are attempting to mitigate and manage costs by again, um, introducing a number of alternates into the project. So you as the board can decide when numbers come in, um, what you'd like the scope of the project to be. Um, we've also suggested some minor things like um, toilet accessories, um, trash cans, things of that nature um, that the library could easily purchase and install with its, um, with its own staff and crews versus bidding it out and um, making it part of a contract. So uh, I think we have a good strategy to move the project forward. Shales McNutt has been um, great to work with and we're looking to wrap up our documents, make some final interior design decisions with respect to the finishes and colors over the next few days, put this out to bid and then have bid results um, for the board at next month's regular meeting. Um, Great. So um, any, we do have a little bit of an interiors update um, to show you some of our current thoughts and ideas. But before that, um, are there any specific questions about um, the process? What's in um, anything you've been wondering about that we've discussed over the last few months? I do have a question about the roof. Um, we're going to rebid with the with the entire project. What is the timing for the entire project? And would solar panels still be a part of that? I know we talked about that in the past, Andy. And I didn't know if there were any grants for something like that. We have not identified a solar grant that works um, on our current schedule. The biggest solar grant I know of is uh, the EBSCO grants, which I believe um, is in um, February, that cycle starts in February or March, if I'm, um, if I'm correct. So if that, if we were to pursue grant funding, um, we would be outside of the window of this project. We're expecting about a three to four month construction duration here. Um, so um, there, is, there is a possibility um, of adding that at some point in the future. Um, my recommendation would be to um, get a good solid roof on the facility, um, make sure we know exactly how that's working, um, and then um, pursue those grants for those systems as a separate project. Because um, what we found is that grants for solar actually score higher when you can prove that you've got a good roof that was just redone right there, ready to go. Great. And the other question I have about the roof is we talked about, because we have the consumer I mean, um, commercial kitchen, mm -hmm. would there be any opportunity to add a rooftop garden? The, there, we can add rooftop, what I would call, um, thinking of the correct word, modular trays to provide a, um, to provide um, some plantings on the roof for some environmental benefit in terms of um, lengthening the life of the roof, um, providing some measure of benefit in terms of temperature control. We would need to um, keep those trays away from the exhaust that we have because those have a tendency to kill plants. Um, but um, that's something that, again, certainly could be added to the project at any time once we've got a good solid roof. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Any other specific questions about um, the the scope of the project? Okay. Other than I think there's some trustees that could help install some of those things too. <laughs> 
Sometimes we hear um, what some bid results come back as, and Natalie and I offer to come out and do it for half that, but we're only kidding. <laughs> I was going to say, Greg, you should speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I said some trustees. I didn't say all. <laughs> The other, the other thing we wanted to share with you just really quickly tonight, um, we are in one of the last things that we are finalizing and having some discussions with, um, with um, staff is the overall color palette um, of, of the space. And um, we're finding that a lot of this starts with the character that we establish um, when you first enter the facility um, and some of the interior designs. So, we just wanted to share um, some updated imagery we have of the main maker space and um, just some of the um, flooring and um, design patterning and possibilities. Um, we'll be reviewing this with staff in more detail tomorrow morning, um, but we wanted to just give um, you a unique preview as well. So let's try sharing again. Does everybody see what looks like a PowerPoint? Yes. Great. Yes. So we've started, we've done a lot of work with staff and um, discussed previously we, with you some of the overall color palettes and finishes. And um, while we haven't selected any furniture or any upholsteries yet, that all comes after we know bid results um, for the project. Be, um, and know exactly what we have to work with. Um, we have started looking at some overall colors and directions um, for, um, for flooring in the spaces. So um, I think Carrie is going to sound a lot smarter than I will um, in describing these. So I'm going to flip through a couple of these and um, let Carrie talk about what we're trying to achieve and some of the different options we have. So um, Carrie, I'll flip the slide and turn it over to you if you're ready. Thanks, Andy. Yes. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, this evening, we're just going to kind of flip through some quick updated renderings. Um, you guys are actually fortunate enough, uh, some of the staff haven't even seen some of these updated renderings yet, but uh, we had the opportunity, myself uh, and Natalie met with staff last week in person um, at the building. So that was great to get together with the team to actually look at finishes in person versus a uh, Zoom meeting. Um, so we had the opportunity last week to meet with staff. I showed them a lot of different options. We talked about a lot of different material types and different patterns. Um, and one of the things we discussed last week um, and what we kind of narrowed down to was a couple different manufacturers and floor patterns um, to focus on in the main maker space. Um, I will be presenting all this to staff tomorrow uh, to kind of get their feedback, to update them with these renderings based on what we talked about last week. Um, but we just, for the purpose of tonight, meeting, wanted to flip through these renderings quickly just to kind of show you how we've been updating what Andy has indicated is kind of the main space of the building um, as this is really going to set the tone on what is seen throughout the rest of the space. So um, we'll let Andy just kind of flip through these quickly, but this was the first option we put together that we're going to show staff uh, kind of with the herringbone pattern, lighten up the floor, and this is kind of a combination of a wood look and um, kind of a, uh, I would say like it's hard to see, you didn't see the samples in person, but kind of like a, a concrete not as um, full wood looking. This is another option we did that we're gonna show staff tomorrow. This is also kind of a herringbone pattern. Um, this is this option. And the next one is just kind of a combination of a wood look versus doing some different shapes in the floor with the wood look, as well as some colored LVTs that you can see in the blue in this one. Um, this is the same one as the previous one. Oops, kind of hard to see. <laughs> um, just It just kind of was changing some of the coloring. Uh, one of the things we talked about with staff was if we had more of like an all wood look floor versus something that was in the grays and the blues. So we wanted to show a couple options to staff on what a mostly wood look type floor would look like in the space um, with possibly adding punches of color. Um, I talked to staff about if we do an all wood floor, we could go with adding, you know, additional color on the furniture. So this is in this particular pattern on the floor, we showed an overhead image as well as a 3D perspective. And if you want to go to the next one, this is a different color wood look floor. It's a little bit lighter. 
a little bit of the wood, the blue accents in the back. Uh, and then in this option, we actually took out all the blue accents in the floor and just went with more of a neutral floor. So um, again, taking away some of the, the coloring that was in the floor so we can add it to the walls and to the furniture. So uh, there are more options that we will be reviewing everything. At, like I said, with staff tomorrow, um, I realize for some of you folks just looking at the renderings without actually seeing some of the samples, uh, some of it might not make as much sense looking in the renderings, but uh, the overall color palette has been consistent and has been the same and staff has been in agreement um, as far as the grays and the blues with the yellow accents throughout um, and with some nice wood tones in there. So um, we have been in agreement in that color palette. It's just kind of fine tuning where those actual color directions are going in the space. Yeah, so um, the other, thanks Carrie. The other thing I would mention here is that um, all of the furniture you're seeing all of the colors on furniture and seating um, are just placeholders for now, as we discussed before, we will finalize those selections. Um, once we have a handle on where the build out numbers are and um, what we think we can um, accomplish in terms of a furniture budget. So um, having said that, um, just, just curious um, if we threw a lot of ideas out there and if anything was um, more or less appealing um, to any of you in terms of um, flooring and, and how that's treated, because it really does speak to a first impression of the facility. Well, I would say um, that uh, what I would steer clear of is anything that is trendy and in now. We want something that's lasting. You know, you can change upholstery, paint color, but the flooring, you know, probably will be there for a very, very long time. So, um, I, you know, that that's the one thing I throw out. I do like this light flooring. This is very nice, either with the blue or the, or the gray uh, in this last picture. But I, I just think it's important not to uh, those permanent things to uh, get, you know, what's the in color today, because that in color may be out in three years or four years, so. Well, Carol, I think, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead Debbie. I was just gonna say too, I, I would be uh, curious as to the cost associated between the different options. I mean, I know that laying multiple colored floors can be more expensive in labor costs. And I mean, we, we, we have to be careful here. And, and kind of draw the line someplace because this is a major endeavor. And I think while we all want it to be spiffy, I think we have to think about where we can be fiscally responsible also. Sure. I agree. I was gonna say that I think Carol's being a, a little nice in her estimation about what goes down on the floor and being outdated the moment it's laid would be my observation, which would be the reason to keep it simple, much like the 4C concept that's in front of us now. Like, like, like Carol, I fear that the moment it's out there, it's outdated and it'll look kitschy. Um, this is Christy talking. I, I think I do like this last one of the most that I see. And I, I just wanted to ask about the chairs. So mm -hmm. I, I know this is, just a placeholder, as you said, Andy, mm -hmm. but are we worried about, it depends on our customers. So some of them would might have problems getting into some of these chairs. I don't know, you know what I mean? Just thinking about ease for certain individuals getting into these things. So just a thought. Yeah, we, we did talk with staff. We'll have after, um, as Andy indicated, after the construction uh, drawings, or I'm sorry, after the construction comes back for the building, um, we'll start meeting with staff to discuss furniture. Uh, we are just using this as placeholders. We do have every intention of if we do have a couple higher tables, we will also have a couple lower tables. Um, so there's a combination of the two. So uh, it it's would great, address yeah, your yeah. concerns with you know people yeah. being able to get in as well as people who might want to stand and work, but then people might want to go and sit down and work. So I would say every workspace, I would anticipate there could be the possibility of having a couple different table heights and, and chairs associated. All right, thank you. Thank you. I would say, if, if, I'm, if I may, um, I, I agree with my, my other trustees in that, you know, 
we want to make sure that this is fiscally responsible and that it is kind of universally classic and that it can be adaptable for years to come. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's super easy to paint a wall and give it a pop of color, or add a painting or a mural or whatever, and you can paint over that next week. Uh, flooring is a much more permanent thing. So having something be more neutral, as cool as some of those designs were, um, they are going to lock us in for some period of time. Um, I also wanted to comment um, about the chairs. Um, you know, ADA compliancy is important. Um, I, I will applaud you that these stools look much more secure than the previous version I had seen. And I had, I commented on that uh, prior that I was worried about people being, you know, just people being steady on their feet. Um, and I, I still think there's work to go and definitely making sure that there are lower tables and things like that are, are important. So I don't think we need to beat that horse. Um, I have noticed in all of your renditions, we no longer have, and I don't know the right term that you used last time, but the sort of like skylight, sky, the, the, the ceiling. Different. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, I have to personally say, I like this clean look much better, but that may, I may be in the, the uh, I didn't like the other look, but I'm noticing that all of these don't have that included, which I'm kind of happy about, but I don't know if that's just, didn't put it in or if there we, was- We have that addressed as an alternate. Uh, so your base bid is what you will see in front of you. Uh, Andy, so it will be the cleaner ceiling, the floating cloud ceiling that we had shown in all the renderings um, is included in there as an alternate item. And it's one of those that you know, as we get the cost back, you guys can decide as a board if you want to elect to move forward with that design or keep it as you see in front of you. Thank you. you know, I think, Terry, Andy, I think I think the overarching uh, thought process is, you know, we, we want it to look good, obviously. I, I think the one that I like the best is probably, I'm guessing, is going to be the most expensive out of all of them. <laughs> um, but, um, but go, yes, keep it as simple as we can. Let's keep the cost down because, yes, floors are one of those things. Yes, it's got to look good. It's got to be durable. It's got to do all that kind of thing, especially since you're going to have things dropped on this most likely. So so let's let's just make sure that, that it's good. But, yeah, th this is not an area where we want to break the bank on, that's for sure. I do have to say, I think the first and second one were probably my favorite. But then they got a little too geometric and too 80s mm -hmm. for me, and now these are – these last couple ones are pretty cool too. Oh, I like the one that was the most geometric, I think, out of all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Would we see them again, Carrie? This is Mary Anthony. Yep. Yeah. To see them once more. Yeah, I'll, I'll go, I'll yeah. go back. Yeah. So, yeah, this was the this was the first option. I will um say I, I completely understand your concerns with um cost and labor. I actually did talk to the group last week about that. Um Everything that we've shown in all these options, with the exception of this one, um, are all full-size tiles. Nothing needs to get cut, with the exception of this pattern is probably the most expensive. Um, everything else is a full-size tile. So there's no additional cutting. There's no additional labor costs in any of that. Um, once you lay it in the hair and pattern and go, I mean, labor-wise, once they have it set, you're not looking at anything too additional than you would if you had a straight install. Um, like I said, this one would be a little bit more cost just to do the option of the four different patterns here. And there is some cutting with those square tiles in the middle to make that, that diamond shape. And I did talk with staff too. Um, these are all planks. These are all individual pieces. So if anything gets damaged, ruined, scuffed, whatever happens to it, um, it can be taken out and replaced. And we did talk about that last week, last week and I talked about that with um your staff as well about how we can take any of these planks out and replace them um, if you need to. You will have attic stock as part of your bid um, for additional material, so. And Carrie, is this laminate wood? Uh, this is actually called luxury vinyl tile. So it's actually a vinyl tile. It's not laminate. Uh, laminate would chip and break. Uh, this actually comes out pre-finished. It's You just clean it with a bucket of water and soap. Um, you, you see it, I would say you probably see it in a lot of retail type commercial spaces nowadays, so. And one last question, Carrie, the lighter we get, I'm just kind of curious if we do neutral, but should we go a little darker? Like, will 
will wear and tear from strollers or wheelchairs or things falling on it, will it be more visible on a lighter surface? Um, I actually tend to find it more visible on a darker surface. Um, I, we talked, I was talking last week with your staff about how, uh, you know, we are right off of the front vestibule in this space. Um, we live in Chicago. We know the elements we have here. So water and um, salt will show on a darker floor a lot faster than it will on a lighter floor. Um, black scuff marks conversely then would show more on a lighter floor than they would on a darker floor. So I, as awful as it sounds, it's kind of a catch 22, you know, on one hand the darker floor is good for some things. And on the other hand, the lighter floor is, you know, good for other things as I just mentioned. So, um, the option that we looked at with staff kind of had a combination of some lighter, darker, and kind of in between tones. Okay. This is, the, this is the more geometric one that. <laughs> I like that one, but anyways. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't like that one. I don't like that one. Looks huh? dated. Uh, one of the things staff had talked about was if it was all wood versus adding a little bit of blue in there. Uh, the blue that you see in here. Uh, staff liked some of the blue, but they weren't sure that they wanted the blue everywhere on the floor. So I had mentioned how we can maybe just do a little bit of kind of a trickly effect, but putting a little bit of blue accents in without it having be everywhere on the floor. Um, so that's why, and, I, and we took it away from the front door so that the solid color wasn't towards the front door to show those footprints and kept the blue more towards the back of the space. So that's- To, to me, this looks like schizophrenic that somebody couldn't make up their mind. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. All right. So any, any more questions? No, I, I think that that was really helpful feedback. Um, you know, we certainly want to make sure that what we are doing here stands a test of time and isn't itching for a yet another remodeling in a couple mm -hmm. years. So um, I think the comments with respect to making sure that um, we're were neutral and appropriate um, are spot on and we can take them to heart um, in our discussions with staff and um, show you some of those outcomes when we see you next time. Um, and you'll, you'll see how um, the rest of some of the thoughts um, ca came together. Um, I think what we were thinking here is that in, in a way, the direction that we take with how bold we go um, with the first impression, um, starts to permeate through the rest of the building um, in a way. So we're curious to get your um, feedback and staff's feedback tomorrow so that we can um, finalize some of these selections and um, update these images to show you and um, to show the community what's coming next. Great. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thanks, much. Everybody. All right. Okay. Okay. We're back. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Um, let's keep moving on here. Uh, let's get on to action item five authorization to accept makerspace HVAC equipment replacement bid. Okay. So we went out to bid for the HVAC equipment and the roof for the uh, Belmont property. Uh, we received seven bids back for the HVAC uh, uh, replacement and zero bids back for the roof. Uh, we've talked to the, um, uh, uh, construction manager about that. And uh, he had talked to some of the contractors that he thought were going to bid on it. And um, it turns out that there was a combination of the their current workload and the um, uh, complication of having demolition included in that package that we had um, issued that kind of scared some people away from bidding on that one. Uh, so we're gonna bring the roof back out to bid in the June 19th or um, the bid package that's gonna go, be going out as Andy mentioned earlier uh, within the next week. Uh, but the HVAC, we did wanna get approval on so we could start moving on that and get the equipment ordered. That's, um, there's a little bit of a lead time on that equipment. So we wanna, uh, wanted to bring that to you guys tonight uh, so we could get rolling on that. Uh, what I provided in the memo were the uh, lowest three bidders for the HVAC equipment. Uh, there were alt Alternates included in the bid package. We're not going to go with any of the alternates. So what we're looking for is approval of the base bid amount uh, plus a 10% contingency. The uh, budget for this part of the project was $159,500. Uh, 
and the um, what I'm looking for uh, in an approval is one hundred fifty one thousand three hundred and sixty dollars, and that includes the uh, base bid amount of one hundred thirty seven thousand six hundred dollars plus a ten percent contingency. So I'd be hey, do do we have a motion? I'll move that the Board of Library Trustees awards the HVAC Equipment Rolls Placement Project to Denson's Plumbing and Heating Inc. for the amount not to exceed $151,360, which includes a 10% contingency pending attorney review of the contract. I second that. Good. All right. And that's good. That this is under budget, too. And if you, hopefully everybody caught that, uh, mm -hmm. even with that 10% contingency in there. Uh, before we, just real quick, you, you talk about the you know, roof replacement and, and taking out demolition. So are we going to have to have a separate demolition team come in and do that? Yeah, there's going to be demo that'll be done throughout the building. Um, well, Andy, do you want to speak to this? Yeah, um, you, you were saying exactly what I was about to say. Um, in, in some ways, um, what will happen now in, uh, is um, going to be a little bit streamlined to advance the HVAC and roofing work um, the thought was to make the demolition that was necessary for each of those scopes of work part of those um, packages, um, which uh, sounds like, well, it's, it was in the library's best interest um, in terms of the contractors kind of owning their own demo. Um, it, scared, it appears to have scared some contractors off. So what we will be doing now um, is breaking out a package um, as we bid this next work that is demolition for the entire project. There will be one demolition contractor that will do the demolition for the roof, the demolition that's required inside to get the layout we want and everything else. So I think that will have two effects. It will um, take that pressure off the roofers and get better participation just along with the timing. And now um, demolition is just demolition. We'll have people who can be solely responsible for that throughout the project. And I think that's going to lead to better pricing as well. Okay, good. That was gonna, that was gonna be one of my questions. It, it would sound like that would be, uh, that would actually be helpful. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a good stra strategy to attempt um, from a um, responsibility and ownership standpoint. And um, un unfortunately, I guess the marketplace disagreed. <laughs> marketplace decides. Okay, any, any more questions on this one? Comments? Okay, great. All right, Julie, can we do a roll call, please? Trustee Metal? Yes. Trustee Rule? Yes. Trustee Snort? Yes. Trustee Sufflet? Aye. Trustee Tangney? Yes. Yeah. Trustee Thanopoulos? Aye. President Zick? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Andy, and your whole team uh, for everything you've been doing. All right. Thank up. you, everybody. Look forward to seeing you next month with um, some more numbers and results. Right. Thanks, too. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Thank, thank you, Carrie. Have a great night. All right. Let's move on to action item six here. The library closure due to COVID-19. Mike. Okay, so this is kind of an update as to where we are with the closure and uh, potential reopening plans. Uh, I wanted to give you guys an idea of what we've been doing um, in past meetings. We talked a little bit about the curbside and walk up. Um, that is uh, going um, fairly smoothly. Uh, the returns in the library have been, uh, we were inundated with returns uh, once we opened the return slots. Uh, staff are working through that backlog and um, they're cranking away on that. Uh, we've continued to offer the virtual services and virtual programming. Um, the digital services has um, been offering uh, assistance as well. We have our chat and email services available. We started uh, answering the phones live uh, in the building. And um, we're currently, the building still remains close to the public. Staff are here uh, in a limited capacity. And then uh, we are still not accepting book donations. Um, Starting this week, we are expanding our curbside and walk-up hole pickups to six days a week uh, with a little bit of change in the hours. The bookmobile has resumed operations at their regularly scheduled stop, um, at their regularly scheduled stops uh, with hole pickups only. Uh, 
um, we won't, we're not allowing people on the bus. Um, so they have a, a process in place to socially distance everyone and um, provide people with their uh, holds where they are, which is great. Um, the return bins at the library remain open. The offsite return bins uh, at Camelot Park and Frontier Park are now open. And then uh, the chat, email, phone services um, continue and the building is still closed to the public. Um, the next phase that we're looking at is phase four. So once Governor Pritzker moves us to phase four of the Restore Illinois plan, uh, we'd be looking to open the building in a limited capacity to the public. And in doing so, um, we would uh, have limited hours, we would have limited resources and services available, um, but we would like to uh, be able to offer uh, people to be able to browse the collection, use the computers, stuff like that. Um, these are some of the things that we keep hearing from our customers uh, as we're interacting with them. When are we gonna open? When are we gonna open? When are we gonna open? Which is great. And we wanna be able to uh, accommodate the needs of the community as quickly as possible, as safely as possible as well. Uh, so we have, um, we've done a lot of things in the building to accommodate this, put signage throughout, uh, instructing on um, PPE usage. Uh, we've designated uh, foot traffic, one ways uh, down aisles, uh, we've set up plexiglass at all the service desks. We've done a number of different things. We're, we're switching around some of the desks, the public, uh, changing the self-check um, stations to make them a little bit more socially distanced. Uh, so we've been working, uh, the admin team, the management team, supervisors, frontline staff, everybody's been working on this at different levels. And um, so we've been, uh, we've been chugging away and we feel pretty good about um, this as to where we're at right now. Uh, according to projections, Governor Pritzker is talking about moving us to phase four on June 26th. So our goal would be to open the doors, as I said, in a limited capacity on that date. Um, and when I say limited capacity, we would um, be open limited hours. Uh, we would not open up again to our full hours. We would, uh, our proposed hours are Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. Saturday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. and Sunday, 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, we would, we would uh, require the use of a mask um, by customers and staff. And then um, we would also limit, ask uh, customers to limit their visit to an hour. Uh, we would have public computers available, but only a limited number and it would spread out um, so we could um, you know, manage that and make sure everybody's socially distanced appropriately and keep those clean in between um, visits. And then as far as staffing goes, we're still encouraging staff to work remotely whenever possible, but we are bringing staff back. Uh, we've we're kind of phasing that in based on priority, as I mentioned in previous meetings through phase three that we would be doing that. And then um, phase four, we would be looking to make sure all staff are back in some way, shape or form. Uh, if staff are unable to come back, we are trying to make accommodations to that uh, with through our, with our manager, um, she's been working with staff that don't feel comfortable coming back or aren't ready to come back. Uh, there are, it's a wide range of reactions that we've heard from staff and customers really as to um, us uh, open and bringing staff back in the building or, or uh, having people back in the building. So many staff are very excited to come back and uh, get back to their jobs while others are uh, reluctant for many different reasons. Uh, so we're working with um, those people individually. Also, our HR manager and our finance director are meeting with all of the managers um, to discuss exactly what their needs are as far as hours go. Um, what are they going to be able to accommodate everyone in phase four, get everybody back in the building safely and appropriately, and then um, identifying other areas where staff can work um, within the building. So we have 132,000 square foot building. Um, we're not gonna, when we first open, we're not going to utilize the second floor for the public. So we'll be utilizing some of those spaces up there, the meeting rooms, um, the interview rooms, stuff like that, for staff offices or some relocation uh, staff service. Um, I, I have a couple questions, Mike. Yeah. Um, number one, when is the backlog of returns going to be cleared? And number two, how in the world are you going to manage one hour visits by the public? We're not going to, we're going to ask uh, people to please um, limit their uh, visit to an hour. Um, we're not gonna be chasing people out, but we are limiting the number of people in the building uh, based on 
the guidance by uh, the state of Illinois. They provided uh, guidance for retail, a number of different um, uh, areas. And so we're looking at retail, um, service desks, and uh, offices, our office space as our guidelines that we're going off of. Um, according to that, based on our square footage, I want to say we can allow like 660 people total throughout the building. Uh, however, we're limiting that to about a third. Uh, it'll be maybe 150 customers and uh, plus staff. So uh, we are taking safety precautions there. And then as far as the backlog, I know they were working pretty diligently on that uh, over the last couple of days. Shannon, I don't know if you have an update on that as to where they're at. Yeah, we had, um, since the curbside started, we had 13,500 new holds on top of the holds that were placed since the library closed. So uh, getting caught up when items are still in quarantine, uh, we're still working on it. We hope now that it's six days a week and we have staff in here uh, more frequently and for more hours, we should be at least getting up to the quarantine quarantine date soon. So uh, Shannon, correct me if I'm wrong, but we had 60,000 items that were checked out during, uh, that were out of the building expecting to come back uh, when we opened the return drops. Is that correct? I didn't hear you, Mike. I'm sorry. Uh, if, if I understood it correctly, there were 60,000 items that were checked out while we were closed. Is that correct? Yeah, I think it was actually closer to 64,000 and there's still approximately 49,500 checked out. So. So we've gotten quite a few back, but there's still a lot coming and we're, we're trying to manage that flow as much as possible. Um, but it's, it's, of course, it's, a, it's quite, a, quite a job. And I do have an update. Uh, our manager has just updated me that we have caught up to the quarantine date with holds. Excellent. Congratulations. John, do you have something? Uh, Mike, yeah, thank you, Greg. Uh, my observation was about the return bins and the off-site return bins opening at Camelot and Frontier, if we're seeing that kind of uh, overflow and, and influx of returns in the library itself, I can't imagine those bins are any different. And in fact, given the exposure to the elements, the materials could be ruined. Yeah, those boxes are, they're weather tight and uh, we have staff checking them regularly now. Uh, they were closed previously, uh, but we just opened Some them People up. just lay stuff outside in front of the boxes. Yeah, they, I suppose they could, but um, we're, ho we're hoping to keep ahead of that. We yeah, most of those, most of the locations are covered, including the one at the senior center is actually under an eave, and they are being picked up on the van Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you you actually Deb asked a lot of the questions that I was going to ask too, because I was wondering about that whole hour. I was wondering how we we're gonna how we we're gonna count you know, who's in there. And, that, and that, 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 that's, that's going to be a big deal. I know I've gone a lot of retail. You have the line outside. They've got somebody with a counter, you know, counting how many people are going to be in there because was it 50%, I believe, is what it's going to be at, 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 uh, at phase four. So, yes. yeah. So um, I was looking at this motion here. Uh, before we give it, I'm wondering, should it say, it says the Board of Library authorizes the Executive Director to reopen the library building to public with limited hours and services. Should that say at the beginning of phase four or at phase four until our region reaches phase five? Because that's what you're asking for really is, is phase four, correct? That is correct, right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if somebody, um, if all the other trustees agree with that, whoever reads the motion, if you could add that in, that would be good. Andy? I have a question and I don't know before or, or whatnot, but um, I know that Mike, you just said that you want everyone to wear masks mm -hmm. and I own a retail space that is not open to the public. That is my choice as a business owner to not try to venture there yet. I am watching other companies similar to mine across the country and across the, across Illinois that have customers coming in and refusing to wear a mask. It's my right. You're it's freedom of speech. It's yada, 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 like whatever. Do, I mean, I know we have some sort of security, but this is an issue that is happening and it gets volatile really quickly. Mm -hmm. I'd like to know that we are putting in place some sort of plans for those who do not want to adhere to the advisement of the CDC and to what we are putting out there. Because I can tell you as a business owner, um, I am personally concerned about opening 
for that reason. Um, and I just want to, I mean, I'm sure you guys are aware of it. I'm not trying to say that you're not. I just, I'm curious what we're planning to do. Yeah, we've been working with our security manager on that. And he um, is, we're meeting with all of the supervisors uh, before we open to discuss how to handle those situations. We don't want staff to get into those situations at all. Um, so we are, you know, the security will uh, be managing those, um, you know, we, we're going to ha have to handle those on a case by case basis, but um, we are, we are asking customers to wear a mask before they even come in and security will be at the door or staff, a staff member will be at the door uh, because we will have counters um, to limit the number of people coming in. And so we can have that conversation right when, before they even enter the building. And when, if they don't have a mask and they're insistent on coming in, uh, we are telling them we can offer them the same services uh, without them entering the building. So if you have a book that you would like to, us to retrieve, we can get it. If you'd like a computer, we can bring out a laptop. Um, we're trying to make those accommodations without letting those people uh, into the building uh, without a mask, just for the safety of the customers and the staff. Hey, Mike, I would suggest you run this by Roger also. Okay. Especially well, if you're talking about putting computers outside of the library, there's nothing that's going to stop them from just take, walking off with that laptop. Or it might be a computer station or something. It, it will be down uh, in the lower garage um, entrance. Well, Mike, let, let me ask you one question. If someone came in without a shirt, what would you do? Escort them out. If someone came in without shoes, what would you do? Right, yeah, same thing. <laughs> right. The same no thing with the mask, and I'm sure we're... I'm sure in our behavior policy, it must be covered. Uh, I know at Gail Borden's, we have a, a statement that says anything that would cause concern or alarm among staff or customers. And I think ha not having a mask can do that. Um, the, the, the thing uh, to be prepared for, and I'm sure your staff has talked about it, is if there's a medical reason why they cannot wear a mask, um, I'm, we are thinking about that we would just have a place where they would sit and we would retrieve what they need rather than, you know, uh, them, well, they don't get to wear a mask because they have a medical condition and they're walking around the library. Um, one thing I did, I'm sure that you, were, you know, you had said what's not going to be available and you said no seating, just remember the senior citizens, they need a place to sit somewhere. So some benches that might be strategically placed. Um, for that. So. Yeah, I should clarify that. We're um, going to be moving our tables and chairs, but we'll be keeping probably our large sofas. Yeah, uh, just some place where, yeah, if people need to, to sit for a bit, yeah. Chrissy, did you have something? No, it was covered. It was covered. I was just going to say, what about the option of even offering a person a mask? You want to come in? Take this mask, you know? Yeah, I was going to put that, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I will also say as far as couches versus hard seating, this is just a, kind of a moot point, but um, uh, for those who have bad knees and bad hips, getting off a couch can be much it's harder hard. than mm -hmm. getting off of a hard chair that has, especially if they have ar like armrests mm -hmm. that they can push up off of. Just yeah. two cents. Yep, We've point. seen it a lot, but, so. You know, I, I think to, uh, to Carol, which is uh, your point, yes, we I'm sure we have policies that we can evoke, um, you know, with the with the right situation. I think the one thing we just have to be concerned about, I think this is kind of where Andy was going, is that these can be volatile situations. So we just have to make sure that we have as clear directives and rules and procedures for for, for everybody in the staff uh, for, for, for when these things come up. You know, you may want to talk to, to, to the village also, and if you haven't, and um, what their policies are and how they're handling different things and how they will respond also to it. Um, Mary Anthony, did you have something? Yeah, I was wondering if we should look at one increased security, um, especially in the beginning as we phase in, because we don't want the security guard to be addressing that and then not addressing some other issues. So I feel like we need a tag team approach. Um, the other thing I'm just wondering about for seniors, is there, could we get some of those like rolling chairs, like when you're walking, and then you can sit on them. Just something to think about, even if we had like 10. We, well, we have a couple of them, don't we, Mike? We do. Yeah. We have a couple the, of one, the ones that are like walkers, like you're right. Yeah. We have a walkers. And, yeah. Yeah, we have two of them. Could we maybe get a few more? I'm just, again, putting it out there just in case. 
it might be something to think about. Well, I would only say that if someone needs that, they will have it. And even if someone thinks that they should have it, if they don't have it, they don't want it. <laughs> that makes sense. You know, they're not going to use it. Yeah. yeah. Makes yeah. sense. True. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Any, any, any other comments, questions? Mike, did you have something? Just to address the question about security. Um, so we, as I mentioned, we're trying to bring as many staff back into phase four as possibly. Well, we're trying to bring all of our staff back by that time. Um, staff that are not gonna have, a, uh, because of shortened hours or uh, limited space on public service desks, we're looking for other areas to utilize staff and helping to monitor situation, not situation, but the building um, or you know, uh, increment at the doors or something like that are areas that our uh, security department will be utilizing additional people um, if they volunteer for those roles. So we are gonna be ramping that up. Good. Okay, um, we do need somebody to make a motion. Trust you to make a motion. Somebody, anybody. I move that we, uh, the library board of trustees approves the reopening plan as out laid by staff as per phase four of the governor's plan for reopening in the state of Illinois. Second. Do we need to say with limited hours and services? Yeah, you wanna, read, you go ahead and read that Marianne. Um, the board of library trustees authorizes the executive director to reopen the library building to the public with limited hours and services. Um, as the state of Illinois opens in phase four of the Restore Illinois reopening plan. Yeah. And do we throw in that part until our region reaches phase four? Phase five. Right, five. Five. So we need, we yeah. need to that is, we don't know when phase five is going to hit. Mm -hmm. And you may find yeah. that, well, let's add more hours, you know. Um, so but, I, I think that restricts. Because we don't know. I mean, th that is a real uh, nebulous state at this point. Yeah, I agree with Carol. Okay. So, so what okay. Mary Anthony said was correct, right? Yeah, I'd stick with the phase four. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Did we have a second on that? I'll second. Sure. It. Okay. <laughs> Julie, if we haven't confused you enough on that one, hopefully you got it. Um, <laughs> can we can we do a roll call on that, please? Trustee Metal? Yes. Trustee Rule? Yes. Trustee Smart? Yes. Trustee Sutcliffe? Aye. Trustee Pangney? Yes. Trustee Sutcliffe? Aye. President Zip? Yes. All right. Thanks, everybody. All right. Let's keep moving on here. Let's go to action item seven, the temporary policy due to COVID-19. Okay, so this is a policy that um, I brought forth to amend some of our other policies uh, in a temporary fashion during the, um, during this closure or the, uh, the changes that we've been talking about. So um, because of all limited services, different hours, a number of these different things, um, some of our policies don't necessarily reflect those. And so this policy would amend those to be in line with the things that we are doing um, to accommodate the, uh, the changes. So uh, one of them, if we could just kind of go through these, the hours of service, um, I'm asking, I was asking in here to uh, give me the authority to set those hours. I'm not, as I mentioned, we're not gonna be bringing the library back uh, to the normal hours at this time. Um, I don't know when or uh, when we actually will. So I wanted to be able to change those as um, as necessary throughout this time. But with that motion that we just made that um, with the limited hours, I think that that would address that um, up until the point that we're ready to open up back to full hours. You know, uh, uh, could, I, could I just jump in here just for a second? You know, a lot of libraries are doing that, limiting hours. And, and I'm wondering the reason, especially if we want all of our staffs working. And by having more hours, yes, it might not be as busy, but now we have uh, spread out 
the staff more, um, you know, by those, I mean, maybe we don't stay up until 10 o'clock, but, you know, I'm just pointing that out that when we compress the hours, that means we've got more people in, in, in that, uh, in, in that completely agree, limited which amount. I'm, so that's all I wanted to say. No, I, I completely agree. And that's why we brought the hours back to where we did. Um, we're not, we're not shorting the hours by very much. It's a couple no, of hours. No, you're not. You really aren't. So what I wanted to do was I didn't, I, I kind of felt that between eight and 10 during the week is a really quiet time anyway. And so mm -hmm. we want to evaluate the need of those hours as we move forward. And yes. then same late night and the weekends, you know, those, I don't know that those are really necessary. However, we're still providing enough hours where customers and staff both can spread out throughout the day. So yeah, that I was, think you are. yeah. I just wanted to point that out, you know, that. No, uh, and I will agree with you, Carol. Um, it was a conversation I actually had with my staff today in that, you know, we're trying as a small business, trying to bring back as many of our staff as we can in as many normal hours as we can, even though our revenue is not the same. And how do we do that safely and still allow people to come in, right? So you can't have like, if I'm only allowed 10 people in my studio, I can't have five be staff because that doesn't allow revenue to come in. So um, no, it's a good point that you're making in regards to like possibly spreading out the hours. And Mike, I'm really glad to hear that you guys are evaluating that and, and, you know, finding a good balance there because that's all this is. We are just all tiptoeing. Mike, another question. Uh, are you intending, um, you know, one, once the building's open and now, now those parking lots are going to be needed for customers coming with the curbside end and you go back to servicing people through the drive up. Is that your plan? Yeah, our plan, yeah. Our hope is that we can get through this major surge of holds before the 26th and go. Mm -hmm. What we need to do is get the um, the number of cars coming through below about 200 per day yeah. uh, before the 26th. So if we can accomplish that, then we'll go back to the uh, drive up window. That's our that's our goal. Well, and another thing to think about, because I think you did this before, maybe have longer drive up window hours. Maybe they open an hour before the building does. Or something like that, because I I think it didn't didn't you have that before? They open at seven a.m. Yeah, or seven. Well, maybe if it's not seven, at least it may be eight, right. or something like that, because then that could spread more more cars out. Um, Mary, I think. Yep. President Zick, are you going to say something? I didn't want to. Yeah, I was just going to say something really quick. Um, well, Mike, are you planning on going through all these policies? Well, let me take a step back there. One thing I just want all the trustees to kind of think about just, and this is from a more of a procedural standpoint than anything. Um, typically what we do when we're making any kind of policy or making any kind of uh, change to a policy, typically we, during the cow, actually, we, we, we discuss it, we go over it. And now that gives us two weeks to digest it. And in case there's any public comments that, that, that come in at this particular point, the way this is being presented, we, we, we don't have that time to do that. So here's my suggestion is we do have a cow coming up on July 6th and we need to talk about that date to make sure everybody's going to be around. Do we want to make this and, and a temporary situation? I know Mike, there's a, a, a motion that you have going that does say that, but it's just through phase four. Do we want to make this, temporary to the fact of that it goes to actually July 6th for right now, it gives us time to digest this a little more because there's a lot of things on here. There's a lot of policies on here and, and it's hard in three or four days to, to really digest how all these interact and go together. So we say, we'll approve this temporarily through the July, through the next, through the next meeting, if we want to state it that way. And then we can go on to finalize it more because we don't know, to your point before, Carol, we don't know how long uh, phase four is going to be. And I, and I think we owe it to ourselves to kind of think about this thing a, a little bit more than get it on a Friday and then, and then vote on it on a, on a, on a Tuesday. Any, any, any thoughts to that from other trustees? I, uh, I concur and I concur for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, we have always looked to public comments, whether we get them or not, on policy changes. And I think that's part of our mission of transparency. And second of all, this gives us a little time to hear from Mike then how this is all going. And I think that's, it's a fluid situation. And I think that's important to hear because I think there may, may be some adjustments to policies even after this couple of weeks. So I think that is the prudent thing to do. Um, I wanted to add what Carol was saying earlier 
um, it's interesting that one of the customers uh, compared us to like, he misses the library in his barber shop. So I'm going to use that analogy and go with it because everyone, you know, has that service and that uh, connection. So salons, I've always thought like one of the, um, one of the reports that I'm reading is that they're extending their hours. And it makes sense because if people are working even before COVID, like I would go get my hair done at six in the morning. I know that sounds crazy, but that's when I <laughs> might have that hour. It's like when you go for a job or at nine o'clock or eight o'clock. So even though we might be already evaluating those hours as June 20th is going to be the longest day, right, of the year. I think we really, in the next two weeks, we should actually extend the hours. And if we can, and if staff is on board and we have the proper staffing. Um, and that, that means that it might even be quiet, but that gives people, some people, our customers are going to be nervous coming back in. I also want us to look at maybe what Mariana's is doing and Target, um, maybe offering um, people that are at risk that first hour, or even we can, I don't know if, if people, if the trustees agree, um, or if this is something with the staff, but pregnant women or people who have pre-existing or over a certain age, if that hour is allowed for them, again, they might feel that that's a service that um, they would then employ, but they might not otherwise. Yes, we are, we are, we have, uh, Mary, you had your hand up, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say we are uh, going to reserve the first, we're going to call it first hour on Fridays for vulnerable populations. Great. That's great. Great suggestion, Mary Ann. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Any other, any other comments, thoughts on here? Um, da -da 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 -da. I, I guess, um, sorry, just jumping on, um, you know, Thank you, Mary, for having that idea. Like, so like, I mean, Mary Anthony, I'm, I'm with you, but the fact that our staff already came up with it and has a plan, like I'm super impressed. Was so, it just me? <laughs> I'm sure. I, I just, I'm just saying like, yeah. I, I want to not take it that further. I'm not taking credit for it. I think it's wonderful that the staff is already doing that, but I'm wondering if we could do first hour every day. We did, talk about we did talk about that and we thought we would evaluate it and see how it goes, what the demand is, and we could get some feedback on if we need to increase it, what days are better, uh, and so forth. So we thought it would be easier to increase than take away. That's why I think we should let this go for a couple of weeks, talk about it again at the count, and then we can make some modifications. I agree totally. That's exactly what I'm saying. And Deb's right. Deb's right. Like as, as a perception to the public, when you start, when, when they somehow get the idea that you're taking things away from them, um, because we've evaluated that it's not needed or it's not necessary, or it's a better fiscally responsible thing to do. It's still, you're taking this away from me and they get really upset about it, but little bits showing them that we are supporting and we can grow that, I think is a great way to address. And, and I mean, I've been in so many seminars and webinars and, and conferences with other business owners across the country. And what are you doing? And what are you seeing? And what are you hearing? And what are you feeling? And this whole country is just on our last nerve. And so I think the best that we can do is try to allow our our staff who does an amazing job and then we can add to this programming or add to those hours but let's let i think this is a great plan so kudos good job okay do we have a motion for this President, uh, me to read that motion yeah oh. yeah okay. why don't you do that the Board of Library Trustees recognizes and adopts the temporary COVID-19 policy, amending existing policies effective March 14th, 2020 through, um, through you said July 6th. Our next board, be our through, next board through, meeting. Through our, ne through our next meeting, because we'll have a special board meeting. Next board meeting. I'm gonna start it over again. 
Do July twenty first then. Yeah. Well, no. Well, we if if we do this, we can. Our next meeting is a cow cow, but we can make that to a special board meeting. Our next special board. We have our next meeting. Board, our next meeting. I won't say. It's our next board meeting. Just say our next board meeting. Okay. The Board of Library Trustees recognizes and adopts a temporary COVID-19 policy amending existing policies effective March 14, 2020 through our next board meeting. Period. Right? Yep. yep. Do we have a second on that? I second. 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 Okay. Any more questions, comments from anyone? Okay. Julie, can we do a roll call, please? Trustee Metal? Yes. Trustee Rule? Yes. Trustee Smart? Yes. Trustee Suplet? Aye. Trustee Tangney? Yes. Trustee Thanopoulos? Aye. President Zick? Yes. All right. Let's keep moving on. I've got a few more things here. Um, action item A, review issuance of non-resident library cards and approval of non-resident card fee. So uh, every year uh, the board reviews and uh, updates the uh, non-resident card and the charge for the card. Uh, we use the uh, general mathematical formula method to figure the card fee. Uh, this year, the proposed cost is $447 and there's a worksheet um, with your memo that shows how we got to that amount. Uh, that would be effective July 1st through June 30th, 2021. So, I, have a I have a question. Yeah. Um, Mike, I know that's, is that the maximum amount we can charge? Can we charge less? I believe that's just the amount that we would be, that we would charge based on this worksheet. So yeah, I don't believe it's a maximum. I, I believe it's, this is. So can we charge less if we so and, choose? We, we, we are bound by charging mathematical formula uh, a tax tax method, tax bill method. That's what Gil Borden does. And what I think there's a third one. So you're really, um, I mean, this is a formula for the mathematical. The tax bill method is applying the tax rate to someone's tax bill. Um, and then I, I can't remember what the third one is. Does anyone remember what that is? I don't, but anyway. So yeah, to answer your question, I don't know. I, it is what it is. Where, where are you trying to get Deb? She wants it lower. <laughs> Yeah, I would like to see us uh, provide accessibility to our facility. I mean, these people, it's, I mean, that's it. I mean, $400 is a lot of money for a non-resident. I agree that our priority should be our residents, but if we're open and inclusive, I, I, it's a lot of money. And I just want to know, we don't make that much money on it. And I just want to know if it can be lower. That's all I'm asking. Okay. How many non-resident cards do we have, Mike? Uh, Shannon, do you know? It's not that many. Non-resident um, cards, we have seven. Seven, yeah. Just oh, really? That's my point, exactly. Right. So, Deb, are you saying that you think we would get more residence cards if it was more affordable? I think we get more. Well? I think we get more non-residence cards if it was more affordable. Absolutely. So, so okay. how much that the price? I mean, what's what's the right? Cost? That's the question, right? The yeah. law. The law. Administrative code, well, I think, under, yeah. And, and I'm thinking that I read somewhere, see right now the law states that a library can opt out of this program, but did I read, did you, did, or I feel like I read somewhere where they're gonna pull that. And in other words, I, yeah, don't, know if was, we're gonna, I don't know if we're gonna be doing this every year like we do it. It was, Elk, it. It was Elk Grove, you're right, Carol. It was the with the Elk Grove settlement on non-residents. Remember, they had that litigation with the trailer park. That's where yeah, it was. Well, well this, this is just recent, Deb. You know, I, I thought I had just- Are you talking about it. the Cards for Kids Act? No, no, I, I thought it was something else, but it, never mind. I Because I so can't can confirm it. Can we push it. this to the cab <laughs> so we can figure this out? Well, yeah. Mike, do you, you want to say anything about the Kids for Cards, which is a new law? Yeah, so that's a, um, a new uh, law that recently passed, which prohibits libraries that offer non-resident cards from charging fees to students in unincorporated areas 
whose income falls at or below the U.S. Department of Agriculture uh, income uh, eligibility guidelines. And so we'll be bringing a uh, policy change for this likely in July. Mm -hmm. um, so there is some relief there for people that, for students that are, um, that do fall below the income level uh, set forth by the Department of Agriculture. One more thing, I don't know if Trustee Smart is um, thinking about businesses, but businesses are entitled to get a library card. So they're, they wouldn't get a non-resident card. And I don't think a lot of businesses necessarily know that. I know our staff probably provides that, but until someone is like there telling them, like it, sometimes it doesn't ring a bell. So I think a lot of businesses would get a library card and are considered, they're not considered non-residents. Right. So with the makerspace, a lot of like the businesses are entitled, I don't know, it changes library to library, but it could be one to two representatives of that business. Uh, again, it's whatever the policy, our policy says that it is, if it is there. So oh, we've got a motion uh, here. Personally, I'm, I'm fine with the, the mathematical formula and how, and how we're doing it. Um, so we've got a motion here. Either what we're saying is we're going to state this motion, vote on it, or we're telling, the, we're telling Mike and the staff to go back and figure out another way to do it or until we get this, ch this children's or, cards. Or, 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 or a simple call to Roger. We could we could pass this motion now, but let's have Mike just follow up with Roger and, and, and get a clarification. We can always come back and change it at the cow. That's what I would suggest. But I'm I'm just trying to think about yeah. we're we're talking about accessibility here. Sure. And, and I mean Yeah. And I and I know and I agree. We all want to make it as accessible as possible. But um all right, so does somebody want to read this motion the way it is? Okay, let's see. Yeah, I, I will. The, the, the Board of Library Trustees affirms its continued commitment to offering a non-resident library card option under Public Act 92-1066 and sets the annual fee for the card using the general mathematical formula method at $447 effective July 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2021. Do we have a second? Second it. Okay. Any any more comments, questions? Okay. Julie, can we do a roll call, please? Trustee Little? Yes. Trustee Rule? Yes. Trustee Smart? Yes. Trustee Suplet? Aye. Trustee Tangney? Yes. Trustee Thanopoulos? Aye. President Zick? Yes. All right, thank you. Okay. Uh, yes. Greg, can I just say one thing? You know, sure, Carol. If, if in fact uh, staff wanted to show the board the, the options, you know, you could take those seven non residents or a couple of them, maybe not all seven, look up their tax bill and then apply the tax bill method and see what it comes to. Um, it, chances are it could come higher than the $447. Uh, dollars, so. Um, but just a thought. I did. We'll do yeah. that. We'll do it. Yeah. Okay. Let's keep moving on here. Let's go to action item nine, the 2021 library holiday dates and closings. Okay. So again, another annual uh, approval from you guys. Uh, this <laughs> is the proposed holiday dates and closings for 2021. Uh, I identified, a, let's see, uh, one of them there, um, Monday, July 5th, uh, is... A little bit different than normal, being that uh, the uh, federal holiday will be on the Monday, and mm. the Independence Day parade will also be scheduled for Monday, July 5th. In 2010, when July 4th fell on Sunday, the library was closed on Sunday uh, as an unpaid day, and it was also closed on Monday, July 5th, as a paid holiday. So this proposed schedule reflects that same recommendation. Okay, uh, do we have a motion on this one? Sure, I move the library board, I mean the board of library trustees approves the 2021 library holiday dates and closings. I second. Okay, any, uh, any comments, questions on that one? 
Okay, Julie, let's do a roll call again, please. Trustee Muddle? Yes. Trustee Rule? Yes. Trustee Smart? Yes. Trustee Sufflet? Aye. Trustee Tangney? Yes. Trustee Thanopoulos? Aye. President Zick? Yes. Okay, let's move on to action item 10, the 2020 board meeting schedule. Okay, so one more. Um, so this is the board meeting schedule for 2021. I identified a couple of dates in here that um, you guys want to discuss. I also recommend this to how to move them around. Um, we can go through them individually if you'd like. That'd be preferred. Uh, so January Committee the Whole falls on the 4th of January, which is the first Monday after the New Year holiday. So that may be a hectic day for people. Um, we could bump it. I, I don't think it's necessary to go through each one individually. We, we had a chance to read it in advance. Yeah, right. exactly. Okay. okay, that's fine, Mike. That's fine. Uh, does and anybody... With that, and with that in mind... Yeah, with that in the mind. Board of library, the, I move the Board of Library Trustees to approve the 2021 Board of Library Trustees schedule of meetings as discussed. And I second it. Okay, the one thing that we do have, though, though, John, is that there are some changes that they're recommending on here. So when we're doing that, are we saying, as Mike was starting to say, you know, are we staying with that January 4th one or are we moving it to the recommended January 11th? We're taking the staff recommendation. Right. So we're going July, January 11th on that and all the other items that you have through here. Is everybody, is everybody comfortable with that? All the other changes that that that, that they're uh, suggesting, not on the chart. This isn't just solely on the chart. It's 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 what they have in the writing. Right, as discussed. Yeah. Everybody's comfortable with that. Understands that what, what we're doing. Yes, and I'm thank you, sir. Huh? I'm sorry, Deb, Deb. Do you want to go? Yeah, just send us a new chart with their recommendations. Sure. Mary Anthony, do you have something? Yes, I just wanted to say that this has come a long way. So I wanted to compliment the, the staff because that um, I really feel that some of the, you know, religious holidays that have not always been observed are, um, and we're cognizant of that. So we are very right. inclusive. And I just wanted to thank the staff for taking the board's recommendations uh, from a few years back and really dive into this. This is wonderful. Okay. All right, so we have a motion and we have a second, correct? Correct. So, Julie, let's do a roll call. Trustee Muddle? Yes. Trustee Rule? Yes. Trustee Smart? Yes. Trustee Sufflet? Aye. Trustee Tangney? Yes. Trustee Thanopoulos? Aye. President Zick? Yes. Okay. All right. We've gotten through everything. Um, okay, so we're on to others. So let's real quickly talk about the next meeting. So we're going to be, uh, the next meeting is going to be, well, it's supposed to be July 6th, but it's going to be, more importantly, it's going to be after what the what supposedly is going to be phase four, uh, which is supposed to be June 26th. So the idea at that particular point is that it looks like we're probably going to have, uh, we're probably going to meet up again at the library with the idea, obviously, that we are going to, um, uh, you know, observe all social distancing rules, probably very similar to, to, to what we did at that, the one meeting the fifth, where, we're, where we're in the Hendrickson room, we all had the big tables and everything, do something uh, to, to something similar to that. Um, does anybody have any concerns or any comments or, or, or questions about, about doing that in the next meeting? Okay. All right. So we've got that point. Now let's actually talk about the meeting. Um, let's be realistic here. This meeting is scheduled for uh, July 6th, right after the July 4th meeting. Um, obviously, we're going to have this one policy that we need to review again. Um, uh, Mike, do you think there's going to be anything else there? Does anybody feel that we should have that meeting? Yeah, they're going to be, uh, Donna, do you want to talk a little bit about budget? Great. 
Yes. So we need to review budget targets. And typically we do that at the cow and not the board meeting. If you want, we can, we can do it at the board meeting. Um, but, but usually we go over them at this cow. And do we then vote on them at the next board meeting or do we do any kind of action at the next board meeting? At the next board meeting, you'd vote on it. Yes. Do, do I remember correctly that the budget date didn't say something about July 13th? Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. So if we moved, so the board meeting is on the 21st. If we moved the meeting, the cow to the 13th, but we make that a special board meeting uh, so we can, we can vote on this policy uh, adjustment. Um, how does everybody feel about that? Is July 13th a problem? That's a Monday? That's a Monday, yes. Oh, and with me. Okay. It's okay. Okay, Christy, John, yeah. Andy. It's good. It's good. Not a problem. Okay, John, you good? Yep. I may be okay. out of town for one of those July meetings, but I definitely say go with the majority. Okay. And so let's so let's move that. So let's so we'll cancel the cow on the sixth. Let's move the meeting to the thirteenth. And if we can please schedule that as a uh, as a special board meeting, uh, I'd appreciate it. Thank and you should okay. Any other other? I have one other thing. I uh, just wanted to um, let you guys know that we're going to be starting up the Friday mail again um, once staff are back in the building. And I wanted to have a quick conversation as to it, do you guys find that useful? Is it, um, are you seeing duplicate information that you're getting in other ways? Uh, do you want us to continue it in the same format and same delivery methods? Uh, just wanted to have some input from you guys on that before we resume that, make sure that it's worth it. Mike, I missed that word. What are we talking about? The Friday mail. That you guys mail fine. newsletter. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I look at it. Yeah, I was fine with it. You good with it as it is? Yeah, you know. Yeah. Well, you had done it before um, with like just, was it just the link? And then, then, then we went back to the full article, correct? Yeah, there were some problems with the link. People couldn't. Oh, that's too bad because I, I scanned that. That was great. You know, so easy right. to scan. I click on the, the links that I wanted to see. <laughs> okay. If that's possible, I think that it, it makes it a little more efficient. But if it's not problematic. All right. We'll talk about that internally and see if we could do something like that. Sure. I would agree with like, let's not have you guys spinning your wheels. But on the same length, I, I do appreciate seeing some of the things that maybe I, I've missed or haven't picked up on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Love the Friday mail. Missed it. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Janet. You have fans. <laughs> <laughs> We're the fans. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Uh, any, uh, okay. I'll ask it again. Any other other? Any uh, other? I got something here. Hold on a minute. Hold on. Yes. I do too. I do too. Steph doing Dan. now. She wants to show the sunset. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Whoa! It looks there nice. we go. Look at how packed it is. It is rocking. Oh wow! Packed. Yeah, it is. It's packed. Oh, oh my gosh! Our, our alfresca. Yeah. I'm on my balcony, Carol. Yeah, I'm not. I'm right I'm above on, it. I, I I'm looked on down my balcony. It. It's beautiful. Yeah, oh, it sounds great. It's to show okay. everybody your balcony, Deb. Okay, here. Okay. You know, Carol, you should you should show so us yours, pretty. Carol. Yeah, where's yours, Carol? Come on, move. Let's go see yeah, it. I have to get I don't know. Yeah. I got this laptop. I it's not easy for me to okay. Okay. do it. Okay. You know, I have one more other. Um would the board ever consider now I know it might be um 630, some you know, Zoom, it makes it much easier than in person. Would the board ever consider moving the meetings to seven o'clock rather than seven thirty? Sure. Just think about it. it. Doesn't have to be an answer, but you know, um, it, it just. I'm I'm thinking. You know, this is what a two-hour <laughs> meeting. This this would have been nine thirty <laughs> normally. Right. Yeah. But, uh, otherwise, maybe nine seems a little bit easier. But just a thought. Yeah, just something to think. Something to think about. Think about yeah. that. Let's talk about it at the uh, at the, at the next meeting. I have one other thing that I'd like to add. Yes. 
I think we should toast Mary and the team for winning that Life uh, Live and Learn Award. How wonderful. It was great that Mike shared that with us. It was very yeah. cool. Mary, congratulations. Yes. Congratulations, so, Mary. Congrats. That's my wine glass to you, guys. <laughs> <laughs> my, my Wendy's cup here. <laughs> yeah, I just have okay. water. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers, yes. Okay, any other others? It's a lot of others today. Yeah. All right. Can we have a motion for adjournment? I so move. We have a second. second. We got a second. Okay, Julie, I guess we have to do one last roll call. Okay. Trustee Metal? Yes. Trustee Rule? Yes. Trustee Smart? Yes. Trustee Sleplet? Aye. Trustee Tangney? Yes. Trustee Thanopoulos? Yes. And President Sick? Yes. All right. All right, everybody. Thank you all very much. Have a great evening. Good yeah. meeting. Well run. Uh, can't wait. Keep up the good work. Take care.